This is a six by nine foot prison cell. In 1973 in Louisiana, a man named Robert Hillary King was placed in a cell like this one in solitary confinement. He was kept in isolation like this for over 29 years. In 2001, his conviction was overturned. When he finally left his cell, he had to relearn what a face was like. His memory was left impaired and he lost his ability to navigate. Academics theorised that social areas of his brain had atrophied. It was as though his brain had rewritten areas that were not necessary for survival in his cell. But in a post-lockdown world, how will your own time in isolation have changed you? Has your mind been rewritten? To understand the effect isolation has on you and how you might behave, we must also know the effect it has physically on your brain and its chemistry and vice versa. In other words, your behaviour and circumstances affect your brain chemistry and in turn, your brain chemistry affects how you behave. One of the terrible things about the pandemic is it has made us fly in the face of what makes us human. Humans are a very weak species compared to uh, most other creatures. We don't have claws, we don't have fangs, we didn't have ways back in our evolution to protect ourselves except to group together. So it is so deep in our psyche and in probably in our DNA, probably physiologically, to feel safe and secure when we're together. People have had to face realities that we, we should have faced before, but somehow our, our schedules were a little too filled to think about things like uncertainty or change or loneliness, which was always there before. So now we got this existential slap in the face. You must stay at home. Studies on mice have shown that one month of social isolation caused a decrease of around 20% of the total volume of neurons. During this time, remaining neurons branch out to try and compensate for and overcome the detrimental effects of isolation. But when isolation lasts too long, up to three months, this compensation ends and the loss of neuronal communication is triggered. Two of the key hormones that play a role in our behaviour which are impacted by isolation are cortisol and dopamine. Cortisol is the body's main stress hormone, and ordinary levels of cortisol can actually help control blood sugar, regulate metabolism, and assist with memory formulation. However, your body releases additional cortisol in response to modern day stresses too, such as those brought on by the pandemic, the isolation of lockdown, and the anxiety around returning to the opening world again. When will we be able to return to normal. When we are deprived of others for a long period of time, well, sometimes even a short period, depending on your circumstances, you shoot out a, a neurochemical called cortisol, which is a, a chemical which says, I'm in danger. That high cortisol makes your heart beat fast, raises your blood pressure, it can give you headaches as a result of that cardiovascular change. It can make you crave food because of course you want sugar so that you can move because your brain is telling you run away or fight. Something is bad out there and we got to deal with it. Being under consistent levels of stress like this causes cortisol to flood our blood, which can harm our brain cells directly. When this happens, cortisol causes brain cells to die and impairs the brain from making new ones. This damages neurons and impairs our thinking. When not making new cells, we become less cognitively flexible, which means we are less able to adapt to new situations. As a result, it can become even harder to reintegrate and return to a normal society, as we find it difficult to readjust and adapt. On a long-term basis, our prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain involved in decision-making, can become impaired and disconnect from other brain areas. For those of us in lockdown conditions, this means our brain can experience greater difficulty accessing the cortex, which inhibits our ability to make good decisions. Crucially, it also plays a role in holding our dopamine levels in check. You need the dopamine as you need the cortisol. We're not trying to blank out here or that we're chill, which I can't stomach. You do need these things, but you 
you know, there has to be another part of the brain. And we do have a higher brain, the prefrontal cortex, that can actually um, self-regulate. It can, you know, it gives you rational thought. It gives you awareness. It gives you, it's the braking system. But you have to train yourself to use that. Dopamine is the body's reward hormone. And impairment of the cortex can lead to a release of our regular inhibitions, causing us to turn to bad habits for perceived reward. Normally, we would have very active lives in employment. And as we move through our everyday lives, this results in increased dopamine or more reward to us. But in lockdown, we're not getting our normal hits of dopamine in everyday life. Dissatisfaction and boredom with the daily routines of life are increasingly apparent. Because we had so much less environmental stimulation, the need for a kick was much greater. At the same time, the opportunity for kicks were massively decreased. So you didn't get a chance to go to the gym and meet all your buddies and have a good workout. You didn't get the chance to meet up in the night in the evening for a, a night out at a club. Um, and so you looked for other things, although you probably weren't aware of it, but you were looking for other kinds of stimulation. More often than not, we turn to artificial rewards. This can range from the physical, such as wine and chocolate, to behaviours such as sleeping in, alcohol and computer gaming, which have been more readily available. This isn't good. This leads us to stop wanting for healthy habits and behaviours that are both good for us and can help us readjust to normal life. Instead, you want to keep these unhealthy habits, even think they're good for you, because your brain has been tricked into seeking reward from this behaviour. An additional hormone that is impacted by isolation is oxytocin. Oxytocin is our bonding chemical. Mothers have it when they have babies. It's what connects you to the child, and that's how the baby's brain grows, only through that bonding chemical. And then, of course, later on in life, it's what makes life worth living. When you turn that on, either through kindness or compassion, or you may have it automatically, the cortisol immediately comes down. So if you're just nice to some people, <laughs> in a way, you're giving yourself better medicine. Lockdown can jeopardise the role oxytocin plays helping us to maintain healthy relationships. Normal social interactions have rich sensory components important for the beneficial release of oxytocin. For over a year, we've been told that our regular interactions may be hazardous and that our only safe environment is our home. As we enter normal life, uh, we need to take small steps. It's going to take a lot out of us because our brain is not used now to mixing and to socializing and to doing things uh, freely without checking. So we don't have what's called disconfirmatory evidence. So our fear stays high, our cortisol stays high, our exhaustion stays with us. So what are some of the ways these physical changes impact your mentality, your life, and the lives of those around you. The phenomenon COVID-19 anxiety syndrome was identified and named by Macantonio Spara, Professor of Addictive Behaviours and Mental Health at LSBU, and Anna Nitschevic, a psychology professor at Kingston University. COVID-19 anxiety syndrome refers to a particular set of uh, behaviours, a pattern of behaviours that we adopted in relation to um, dealing with the threat of coronavirus and also in relation to the instructions that we received about how to protect our, ourselves. We develop a scale to assess this particular pattern of behaviours that we term COVID-19 anxiety syndrome. And we found that people differ in the way that they uh, deal with the fear or the threat of coronavirus. So the more people engaged in worrying about the infection, monitoring news, avoidance of public places and transport, the more they became locked in a state of fear. Behaviours that were once a rational response to the danger of COVID-19 become maladaptive once danger recedes. The idea of public transport can freeze you in your tracks. Touching things will be anxiety-ridden. Is that handle dirty? Will touching this debilitate or kill me? These attitudes can persist long after this behaviour is safe to resume, which keeps you locked into pandemic-induced fear. 
around 45% of people in our survey continue to endorse very strongly that they um, avoided using public transport, avoided, uh, about 30% avoided touching uh, things in uh, public uh, places out of fear of um, infection. Uh, they continue to follow updates, uh, worry about uh, the infection. It has been predicted that there will be an increase in anxiety disorders in the post-pandemic society. Research shows that as many as one in five people will struggle with a return from lockdown. The degree of anxiety now on return to normal uh, is uh, completely understandable considering uh, the length of time during which we engage in all these uh, behaviours. We worried and uh, felt very anxious for, for, for so many months. But if people start turning down invitations and going out when objectively the risk has been reduced, then perhaps that's the time when there is a need to seek professional help. OK, we know that our brains can be rewired by our experiences and that we may pick up negative behaviours along the way. What can we learn from them? During lockdown, remember that cortisol shot up as soon as we were told to be afraid. And uh, the cortisol stayed high rather than being allowed to go down. When cortisol doesn't go down, then we don't get a chance to relax and have melatonin, which is another chemical, rise up so that we can fall asleep. Um, so we got in trouble that way because the more sleep deprived you are, the less logical you are. So the less you would think of good solutions to deal with the discomfort you were feeling. Um, and that was where the dopamine fix might set in. Dopamine is what gives you the ability to chase something, you know, to hunt. The problem is when that gets chronic, is that now addiction kicks in. And what's interesting is scientists say that the chase is better than the kill. So what you're actually addicted to is the hunt. When you get finally get whatever you're shopping for, it, you never get the hit again. So what happens is the brain wants more and more. It'll never be satisfied. It just needs a bigger hit. Well, like all addictions, the irony is that precisely the um, you know, the substance slash activity slash digital media that is providing relief from the, from the anxiety is actually exacerbating the conditions in which anxiety is going to flourish when you are sort of dropped back into real life. It's in the moment, perhaps helping to calm or recalibrate or give you some kind of um, self-regulating homeostasis. The problem is that as an as adult in a social world, you have to come back to that and address that. And if you keep, if, if these activities are so compelling that you, you end up uh, living your life in a way that is about maintaining this escape, it does end up not only avoiding life, but exacerbating the conditions that might make you want to keep avoiding life. Overall, this paints an incredibly bleak picture. But the good news is that while isolation rewires our brains, we can also consciously re-engineer our brains ourselves to counteract detrimental effects. Through fMRIs, neuroscientists have shown that the brain is plastic. In fact, we have an innate ability called neuroplasticity, which is what allows us to rewire the thinking and structure of the mind. This ability guarantees for us that our behaviour is never set in stone and crucially ensures that there is a way out from the fears, anxieties and detrimental behaviours that the pandemic has thrust upon us. But how do we do this? One method is by practising meditation and mindfulness. I practice mindfulness. People think it's fluffy. I learned it at Oxford and they weren't teaching witchcraft, so there must be something to it. Tai Chi, there's martial arts, there's a, a yoga, it, but it depends how you do it. What we're trying to do is get the focus into the physical body so that the brain can have a little bit of a rest. Cortisol comes down when you're, that's why they say when you're gardening, when you're running, when you're doing an activity. Brain scans at Harvard and UCLA have shown that regular practice of mindfulness meditation minimizes cognitive decline and builds thicker neural tissues in the prefrontal cortex. The brain can be trained. That's the beauty of neuroplasticity. The brain can say, come on, let's let's pull back. There's 
the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex here, which is like a breaking, you know, it calms it down. But that has to be developed just like a, a six pack when you go to the gym. Once strengthened, your grey matter sharpens attention, builds up your immune system, neutralises a negative pandemic reaction and heightens compassion, automatically shifting you into calm and clarity. Something that can be underestimated amongst all of this is our ability to help each other out. While we have covered the many ways the pandemic rewires us and how we can engineer ourselves, if you know someone who is struggling with re-entry anxiety or with isolation in general, contact them and offer to spend time with them. Another really important thing to do when you decide to reintegrate and you're ready is to enlist a buddy, somebody who you really trust, who you can tell your own fears to and who knows your signals well. And if you go with someone else to do whatever you're doing, you're going to feel a lot more confident uh, and a lot more safe. When you do get together with friends, please not try to do any small talk because what really opens the heart and makes you feel more connected is listening, not just talking. So people don't suddenly start going off on a rant. They just speak their truth and you can do that in two minutes. You know, it, or you go out for dinner and tell somebody what's really going on. They won't be bored. They'll like you more. Reconnecting with others is vital for our well-being. In fact, the evolution of our psychology shows that we live healthier, longer and safer lives when we are engaged and connected socially. I've been talking in rather negative terms uh, about all these uh, terrible things that have happened to us in the last uh, 15, 16 months. Um, and they have been terrible, but I think um, there's also a silver lining. Um, first of all, our resilience. And I think to take that lesson with you, that you can do anything, whatever life throws at you, you can cope with it, is going to make us all, I think, a stronger race, a more resilient race. The second thing we take out of this situation is what really counts. And I say that on two levels. One is all of us realize that other people are what count. Do you want to give Nana a hug? So hopefully you will come out of this prioritizing time with people who matter to you. And I think that that lesson is going to stick with, uh, with, with us in, a, in again in a very positive way, both in our small groups and I hope as realizing humans are a whole race.